Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Fish Traps NEA sponsored Big Read. Uh, we are reading the book In the Heart of the Sea, The Tragedy of the Whale Ship Essex. And I hope you've been able to see some of these events that we've been doing. Um, the, what is the Big Read? Well, it's a, uh, it's a program of the National Endowment for the Arts where we all gather together to enjoy as a community, as friends, as families and ourselves, uh, uh, read a really good book together. And Fish Trap has put together some uh, weekly events to help support that. And uh, today is another one. Uh, we have some, before we get there, I just want to thank um, our community sponsors, Community Bank, Art Center East, um, the Oregon Arts Commission, and the Book Loft here in Enterprise. And today we meet again with Julia Treisenberg from the Columbia River Maritime Museum. That's in Astoria, Oregon, a, a, a town dripping in history with, with captains and sailors and uh, fishing people. So we're great to, we're really happy to have Julia back. What are we going to talk about today, Julia? We are talking all about whaling in Oregon this afternoon. Great. Well, take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me today and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us once again for the NEA Big Read Through Fish Trap. My name is Julia and I work in the education department at the Columbia River Maritime Museum. And today we're going to be talking all about whaling in Oregon. So there's a lot of different aspects of whaling history all around the country and all around the world. But today we're going to focus on this very small window of time when the Oregon coast was actually home to one of the last commercial whale fisheries in the United States. And once again, that's talking about commercial whaling or industrial whaling. From an Aboriginal whaling perspective in the Pacific Northwest, really the First Nations tribes near Vancouver Island and people living near the Olympic Peninsula, like the Macaw tribe is a really great example of people who have a long standing history of this kind of Aboriginal whaling. And that's an ongoing conversation that people are having as we work through, you know, hundreds of years old treaties and an effort to preserve that kind of cultural history. That's in the northwest corner, of course, of the Pacific Northwest and south of that right here in Oregon. There's been some debate by researchers and historians over how much Aboriginal whaling was being done on the Oregon coast. So about 15 or so years ago, there was an anthropologist who found an elk bone that had been carved into the shape of a harpoon and seemed to be stuck inside of a whale bone, which made him think maybe there was some evidence for whaling along our coast, but most tribes uh, will say to you that their history tells them that their ancestors would harvest whales if they came to shore and share those resources with the community um, along our area in the northwest corner of Oregon, farther south near Coos Bay. But there wasn't so much of an active whaling history in the same way that you would find near the Olympic Peninsula or near Vancouver Island. Very early on in Astoria's history, we actually had um, a brief glimmer of being part of what we refer to as the golden age of whaling, this extremely um, populous time for whaling ships around the country. And that's because, right, as you've been learning about and in the heart of the sea, places like New Bedford and Nantucket were considered the heart of whaling on the East Coast. And so they were originally whaling uh, through the Atlantic Ocean. But as they started to run out of whales, they moved to the Pacific and the Arctic. And as they did that, they were hoping that Astoria would become the new Nantucket of the West. Like it could be the new hub on the West Coast, instead of these ships having to go all the way back to the East Coast. And so in 1846, there was this ship called the Maine that was traveling through the Pacific on a whaling trip. And the idea was they would stop in Astoria two years into their voyage to offload everything that they had collected and then head back out to sea before they went back to their home port on the East Coast. So in 1848, right, two years into this journey, as they're heading to Astoria, the Maine was full of whalebone, 
of whale oil. There was about 1,400 barrels of whale oil, and they were ready to offload all their supplies before heading back out into the ocean. The problem that the Maine ran into, and the really important thing that you should know about this area of Oregon, is that the Columbia River Bar, where the Columbia River meets up with the Pacific Ocean, is considered the graveyard of the Pacific. It's known to be one of the most dangerous river to ocean crossings in the world. And so when the Maine came up to the Columbia River Bar and was trying to get to Astoria, it was supposed to wait for a bar pilot, this expert on navigating the area, to be able to get across safely. But the Maine didn't want to wait for a bar pilot. It wanted to go it alone and see if it can make it across. And of course, you can probably guess what happened. It immediately crashed and shipwrecked and lost everything that was on board the ship. So 1,400 barrels of whale oil, two years worth of work out in the ocean, completely worthless because of the shipwreck at the mouth of the river. And so after that, all of the whaling companies on the East Coast decided, well, Astoria couldn't possibly become this new Nantucket of the West because the area itself was just too dangerous for those ships to navigate. Interestingly, over a hundred years later, our corner of the Oregon coast, specifically Warrenton and Hammond, right near the mouth of the river, got a second shot at commercial whaling in the United States with these mink farms that were all around Oregon. So farmers, these mink farmers, started to run out of ways to feed the mink. And before they had apparently been using these wild horse herds that were scattered throughout Oregon and Washington, but as they ran out of horses, their solution was to turn to the oceans, right? Their solution to feed all of these mink was to build a whale fishery right on the mouth of the river near Warrenton and Hammond. And so this was a collaboration with the Oregon fur producers, Bioproducts and their kind of subsidiary company called Halfangst Oregon. And then Frank and Eben Parker owned this whaling boat, or soon to be whaling boat, I should say, called the Tom and Al. And you can see it towing a whale over to Bioproducts near the mouth of the river in this photo here. They outfitted the Tom and Al with this harpoon gun that Bioproducts got from Norway. I'm told it's about a 90 millimeter cannon with these bomb tipped harpoons. And so the idea was that you would harpoon your target and then about four seconds after the bomb would detonate inside the whale. And this was meant to be a very efficient and hopefully faster death for the whale than previous technologies had allowed them to do. Now, of course, this is in the 1960s. This is at the very end of commercial whaling. There really isn't that much whaling going on on the East Coast, and it's dwindling in the West Coast. But Bioproducts was hoping to turn a profit with a few different um, resources that they were taking from these whales. The first one being, of course, the whale meat, right, to feed those mink farms. And a lot of pet food companies as well were going to them. And then interestingly, one use for whale oil that some historians will talk about from the 1950s and 60s was with organizations like NASA. There's a little bit of debate over how much whale oil NASA was actually using, but the idea was basically that whale oil is extremely consistent. It can withstand really, really high and really, really low temperatures. And so it can be used for all kinds of different uh, research missions in extreme environments. As synthetic oils came onto the market in the 1960s, the need for this was a little less, but it's one interesting type of customer that you might not normally expect from the whaling industry. So this period in time, right, this very small window of commercial whaling on the Oregon coast was going on from about 1960 to 1965, with some wiggle room in between those years there. And in those five years, they hunted 13 whales. This photo here that you're looking at is a few of the key players at Bioproducts during this point in time. So on the far right, you'll see Richard Carruthers, who I believe is one of the co-owners of Halfangst. 
On his right over here is Lyle Anderson. He was also a Warrenton local and he was the chief chemist at Bioproducts at the time. And in that center of the photo holding a big flensing knife is Mark Dozier. And we'll talk about him in just a moment. As we go through this, you might be asking yourself because I know I asked myself this question, weren't people horrified that they were still hunting whales? Wasn't this something that the public was upset about or frowned upon or anything like that? Because really, the 1960s wasn't that long ago. But the answer, overwhelmingly, seems to be no. That while maybe a few people were upset at the idea of whale hunting during this point in time, for most locals, it was actually really exciting to get a chance to see these animals up close and personal. There are all these stories of, of barkeepers around here just having completely empty uh, tables when people heard that whales were coming because everyone would go out to bioproducts to watch that take place. You can see here in this photo, there's huge crowds of people coming as the Tom and Al, and Tom and Al is bringing up a couple of whales to be processed at bioproducts. And Mark Dozier, who you saw in that photo, was a really great example of what a spectacle this could really be. He was not actually an Oregon native. He came originally from California and was working at Bioproducts during those few years to help process the whales because he was one of the few members of that team who had any previous whaling experience. And so all of these crowds would come to watch him flens or strip the whales of their blubber um, as this whole kind of event for the day. He became a local celebrity. This next photo I'm going to show you is in color, so it's going to be a little gorier than the last two pictures you saw, but I want to point this out because you can see a few of the different tools that they were using during this time, right? That enormous knife, once again, which we'll get an up-close look at, and then if you look closely at Mark's boot, you can see that he has a bit of a strap or stirrup on there, and it was pretty common to have some kind of grip or spikes in the soles of your boots so that you weren't sliding around on the whale as you were flensing it. Now here are a few artifacts that I was actually really excited to find for you from the Maritime Museum's collection that were actually used at Bioproducts during this time. So just like you saw in that photo with Mark and his teammates, um, here is a flensing knife. I like to point this one out in particular because if you look closely at the handle there, there's actually a six inch whale carved into the wood, which is kind of a fun addition to this knife. Um, I'm told that every worker at Bioproducts had their own flensing knife that they were responsible for. And once again, this was used to help cut into those top layers of blubber as they were kind of stripping the whale of all of the resources that they wanted to use. The next artifact that I found is actually a blubber hook. And we'll look at this a little bit more tomorrow, actually, in terms of the flensing process. But it was basically used to help lift up these layers of blubber as they're flensing the whale, right? You can imagine how thick and how heavy that would be. And so they would use all kinds of tools in order to process the animals themselves. Things like those flensing knives, this blubber hook, um, chainsaws in some cases, Really the idea with bioproducts, and this is true for a lot of different industries, they were working with the salmon canneries for a long time as well. And the goal was to recycle and repurpose as much biomaterial as they could. So they wanted to use as many parts of the whale as possible so that they weren't wasting any part of the animal. And so of course we talked about that meat for mink farms, for pet food companies, Whale oil was also shipped out to the Mount Hood Soap Company, and they would use it for all kinds of different laundry soaps and hand soaps. Um, I'm told that they would grind up the bones of these whales into different types of fertilizer and try to extract vitamins A and E from the whales as well. So there were a lot of different ways that they tried to repurpose the animals that they were catching. And I think part of this was also because it was so difficult to get the whales themselves, right? Bioproducts was based right on the mouth of the Columbia River, but the... Um, the crew members on the Tom and Al would have to go 
miles out at sea, sometimes up to 100 miles out into the ocean to actually catch any of these whales. And so sometimes what would happen is in the time that it took to get the whales from the ocean to bioproducts right near the Columbia, all of these gases would start to kind of ferment inside the whale's body and it would putrefy everything that was inside. And so some of the whales that they brought over to the plant actually couldn't even be processed. They were unusable because everything inside had already kind of thickened and putrefied and grossed, um, grossed everyone out who was working on these whales. And so there were a few different reasons, right, why this period of time for commercial whaling was so short lived on the Oregon coast. That being one of the reasons of not being able to transport the whales efficiently. The equipment that Bioproducts was using wasn't always the most efficient for this particular type of material, right? As I mentioned before, they were um, using all different kinds of biomaterial for salmon, for shellfish, and then repurposing as much as they could with the equipment that they had. But this was a very um, vibrant and very unique point in Oregon history where busloads of school kids would come and they would watch the flensing process take place. There were researchers from Oregon State and the University of Oregon who would come and get samples from the whales as they were being processed. And so although this is a very short lived period of time, it's a fascinating aspect of the coast's history as being one of the last uh, commercial whale fisheries, not only in the West Coast, but all across the United States. Right. This really came to an end in 1965. And I know Dr. Balance talked about this as well in her kickoff presentation a couple of weeks ago. But as you get into the late 60s and early 70s, there are all these new environmental regulations that are coming into place to help um, kind of decide who can hunt, which whales, which populations can afford to be hunted and how many of those whales. And so places like the International Whaling Commission kind of determine those quotas all around the world. There are a few countries here and there that will whale on occasion. And there's a history of research whaling as well, right? Hunting whales for different aspects of research. In the United States, it's illegal, right? Things like the Marine Mammal Protection Act, I believe in 1972 that was. But like I mentioned earlier, there is this history in the Northwest in particular of Aboriginal whaling. And there are certain tribes that are still negotiating how that's going to work with preserving their own cultural history and heritage for generations to come because it's a very different type of whaling than the industrial or commercial whaling that we've been talking about today and we'll learn more about tomorrow. With that, short and sweet, that is my history of commercial whaling on the Oregon coast. Thank you all so much for being here with, uh, with us today. Hopefully we'll see you again tomorrow to learn about the golden age of whaling, this period of time when more whaling ships were out than ever before. My name is Julia from the Columbia River Maritime Museum. And with that, I will turn it on back over to you, Mike. Thanks, Julia. Flensing knives and blubber hooks. You can see them all at the Columbia River Maritime Museum and maybe even Julia will show you around. Uh, I learned a lot. I uh, didn't know that about that part of Oregon history and glad I do now. It looked like messy business. <laughs> and with that, uh, thank you all for uh, tuning in, whether you are watching this in your school classroom, uh, watching this at your lunch break or around the dinner table at night. We're glad you uh, tuned in. You can see all of the Big Read events online at fishtrap.org or at Fish Trap's YouTube channel. Uh, we'll join Julia again tomorrow, Thursday, the 4th of March. Uh, and uh, we'll see you then, Julia, and I hope to see all of you too. Take care.